Blessed Be the Vampire by Dana Lee Chapter 17 I bought a chariot for Dagon, who was still a fine horse, and we rode through Turkey and Bulgaria by night and camped in caves and copses during the day. I don't know what I was looking for or what I thought I'd find. I became like a fox, a nomad, and lived this way off the blood of bats for a year. I then reached the thick deciduous forests of Eastern Europe and the hills. I had never seen forests as such, and the air was cool. I had a fire blazing in the forest one night when the moon was full and blue. I had never seen such a moon. I was now seventeen and felt truly like a man there beneath the stars. There was a mist upon the forest floor. The lushness of this wooded nature awed me. I had never known such beauty. Why would man raise a city out of dust when God's tabernacle of trees and lush lay just to the north? The crickets were playing a nocturne when I heard the sound of a deep-throated song, so sad. I remember that song to this day and how it left me spellbound. I think she saw me first, this forest girl, this gypsy. I think she was watching me when I noticed the bat of her eye. She had the biggest, darkest eyes I have ever seen, and I felt like diving right in. She wore a long cotton skirt dyed red that ended in a ruffle. She had a scarf of the same material tied round her head of jet curls. She had a loose cotton blouse and gold earrings like mine. Gold also hung from her small waist and round her ankles. She was barefoot. I did not scare her. She stepped closer and was luminous by the light of the moon. She came up closest to me, and I could smell her as she untied a white cloth revealing bread that she offered me. She smelled like honey, and she had a sensuous mouth like my mother. She touched her chest. Marabi, she said. Leviticus, I am also charmed. She did not understand. She had a black velvet bag with golden tassels that hung at her side. From here she removed the flask and offered me some wine. No, no, look. While I tasted her bread, which was like manna to me, I pulled the golden flask from under my cloak. I uncapped it and held it out to her, offering some wine. She drank it down long, closing those black eyes. Her lips were soft and irresistible. I had never felt this way before. This was what I was looking for. She opened her eyes and breathed. Honey, this is the best wine I've ever tasted. I'm sorry I drank it all, Leviticus. I laughed and drank another draught from the golden flask. She touched my face with a sing single silken finger. You speak Syrian. Nair had taught me a bit to get by. He had also told us tales of the gypsies who had come up out of India and into Europe and their wild magic. I loved her and my heart raced. And I became stiff and blushed in the firelight. She was frail. I could see the shadow of her breasts beneath her blouse. Charmed. I offered her the flask again. She seemed puzzled, but did not doubt. She drank another flask full. You have magic? Yes, me too. Then she kissed me. I tried to keep my teeth at bay, but she noticed. I wanted to die. I thought she would wretch and scream, run for her life, but she said, oh, and ran her finger across my lips, then kissed me again. She came and straddled me, tucking her colt legs underneath, and I felt for the weight of her breasts, the best thing I had ever felt in my life. Oh, she moaned again, and her eyes fluttered, those lashes, that mouth. She continued to kiss me hard and deep, grinding herself into me. She was hot, and her face was flushed. I continued to rub and squeeze at her breasts, her nipples, until I could take it no longer and had to find them with my mouth. I pulled her down onto me, under me, bigger than I'd ever been. I tore her blouse down and sucked and sucked and sucked. This was what I was looking for. She was beautiful, and I could not get enough. I wanted to eat her. I tucked, took the scarf from her head and shook her curls loose and long, so soft and glistening in the dark. I disrobed there, embarrassed, showing my nakedness to her by the fire. 
when she got up on her knees topless in the red skirt to kiss and suck me. Then I took her into the small linen tent, lay my cloak beneath her, pulled up her skirt and drove into her dark piece down and down deep into the night. My wife, I said to her afterwards, my husband, I love you, she kissed me again, got up naked and slim and brought back something from her bag, tobacco or something that she rolled for smoke. I lost my rigidity in the forest that night, like everything, she was gone with the dawn. I had sensed something near dawn, but fell away beneath my heavy cloud of sleep. The next night, I waited for her, where I had been, and my heart had longing. The following night, I searched the hills for her, when I smelled the honey and found their camp. Chapter 18 I waited until the following night, then crept through the bushes, lurking and looking for Murabi. There were dance they were dancing around the fire like phantoms. The music was intoxicatingly sweet and sad. An old man played the fiddle faster and wilder than any cricket. There was a young bare chested boy on the drum and girls with tambourines. I saw her slip into a tent at the edge of camp. She was dressed in white. I slipped up close, a shadow amongst the shadows. I could feel her anger blaze as I had felt her passion. Then I heard a slap and I came in. A fat bearded man had her clutched like a constrictor with a knife to her throat. I could see the fear and love in her eyes. What do you want with my wife, pale face? I kill her and you too. Leviticus, she whispered. I only ever chose you. He bought me from my father. I only wore, then he cut her throat. I killed him first and ate his heart. He had already ripped out mine in bud. I carried her out and placed her in the undergrowth, her life's blood rushing down my cloak. Then I set the camp ablaze and watched the shadow phantoms dance and burst into flames. I buried her, my gypsy wife, in the forest where she found me, waiting for her. There were black-eyed Susans over her grave, black eyes and honey. Her eyes haunted me for years, the love and fear in those eyes. I saw them in every sunset. I traveled through Bulgaria and into Romania. The beauty of nature, the dark, greens of dusk, the slant of hill, and depth of chasm were the things that fed my black heart. I watched the doe with her fawn, the kites, couple in air, and I thought nothing is more dangerous than love. Love is the only way in and the only way out, even for a vampire. Chapter 19 Leviticus had brought me to tears, like most of the men I'd ever known, except for my father and brother. But then again, I made them all cry, too, with the exception of my maker. Blame it on your black star, blame it on the falling sky, blame it on the satellite that beams me home. He was downstairs doing his best radio head, and my sky was crashing down again. I found that I could not despise him, like God with Lucifer and I didn't know who was who. When I was a child, my mother would terrify me with the threats of the devil. If I was ever defiant, she would dial hell on the telephone. Yes, can I speak to the devil, please? Sure, I'll hold. I know he's busy with all the bad kids. Then, shortly after, because demons are quick, a knock would come at the door. I would scream and beg her hiding upstairs. This worked well. I'd run through the dark knowing he was waiting at every corner to grab me. My grandparents had a cottage in Zelianople and the neighbors, the Wiggins, had a well out back. My mother told me it was the way to hell and if I was bad that he would come up 
there at out of there at any moment. I was even afraid of Peter Pan. Though I loved him, somehow I confused him with the devil. No wonder. Now I knew that he had different guises, depending on the situation. He usually wore black. Were you waiting in the basement for me in my mother's house at the well up at camp? He brushed my hair. My mother was a hairdresser. She called my hair the rat's nest. Yes, I told you I have always been with you. Your dog knew me. He loved me. Do you? I only love Paul. Now you have surely done it. He flew from the room, and I followed after him. Chapter 20 I decided to stay in Austria for a long time, falling in love with the mountains. Built a small stone abode atop a hill alongside the Andres Bay. I found a cave nearby with coal and bats. Felt like home to me. I kept to myself completely now and my house still continued to grow. I had a lot of time on my hands. A mind that had to be occupied at all times and the supernatural gifts of the vampire strength, speed, and intellect. My gifts only increased with time. I found that I could materialize and call the bats at will up to an acre or more. I was also a beguiling beast and had yet to meet my match. I built my forest out of stones from the river, my fortress. This was probably the second best experience of my life up until this time with my hands, besides my abilities with my hands. My mouth may be wholly evil, but I know that these hands have done well. The tower is still there. It's nearly 2,000 years old, and I dwelt there for a thousand years. Do you know the meaning of a thousand years? You cannot. Adam knew. Besides my stone tower, the mortar was made from rice paste, the walls lined with egg whites. I copied the Old Testament by hand, as well as Greek drama, medical journals, and philosophy. I learned German and planted rose gardens. I crafted new stringed instruments, toys, cradles, and furniture out of wood. But never a clock, because time meant nothing to me. Brother of Cain. Dagon passed on, and I buried him in his stable that I built for him. I could still sense his spirit there. Sometimes I go back. I still own it all, and it's protected. It's home to me. There came a time when Gypsy Eyes was only a memory after living peace of peacefully under nature's spell for centuries. Still, women have always scared me more than men, held more power over me, naturally. I knew one woman. She lived in the town closest me at the time, Gras. Some parts were even civilized then, when barbarians ruled. I think some are born civilized and some barbaric, gay and straight, black and white, male and female, righteous and wicked, without much variation in between, if you ask me. A toss of a coin. But what did I know? I'm only a vampire and odds were always for and against me at the same time, and I am my own worst enemy. But back to this woman, Inga. She wove my wool into cloaks, trousers, blankets, hats, rugs, and tapestry. I paid her handsomely, for she did fine work. She was clean, too, for although we lived near the bay, a river, and many mountain lakes, these people were not clean like the Jews. They were filthy and bathed maybe once a year. This abomination plagued me for centuries, human stench. Inga was clean and efficient. I could not master her work, not by candlelight. She had many other customers besides me, peasants and nobility alike, so became well known. She would flirt with me when I came to pay, and she was a fair woman, rosy and hearty, but there was something crafty in her nature that I did not understand, so I mistrusted her and would always slink away in a rush. I think she thought that I was very wealthy, which was anything but true since my money had run out long ago 
and I sold wool for the money I needed. There was a wealthy lord who was her customer as well, Albert III. He owned 2,000 acres and had serfs working the land. He was powerfully connected to the army and had a castle ten times the size of mine. It reached to heaven. He had a beautiful foreign wife, Lorraine, and two sons. He was the most envied man in the mountains. Inga had her needle-like eyes set on him, too, of course, probably her best customer. He scored her at first, for he was proud, and she common. One evening, when I was down from the mountain shopping, I stopped in her shop to check on the trunk she was re-embroidering, mother's work, which had come undone over the year, moths. She had a bell on the door, and when I came in, Albert came out from behind the fitting curtain, then she. I would have thought she was measuring him or something, but her face was flushed and her hair was mussed, and their salt hung in the air. I took no notice, took my trunk, and headed back up the mountain. I was back in town again a few weeks later. They were burning and hanging women, mostly midwives, herbalists, and spiritualists as witches. I turned from this abomination myself to avoid discovery, and because God does not suffer witches to live, but to be a thorn in the side of God. Not that unlike myself, though, so I had my guilt. They seemed like maniacs to me, the townsfolk, bedlam, but I already told you how foul they were, ignorant, too. A child came out from beneath the mob and fell at my feet in tears. Sir, please help mother. They burned her, sir. I can't find her. She looked up at me imploringly with the red-rimmed eyes of a grimy angel. Even Lord Albert's wife, Lorraine, they will hang her tomorrow. Three a week, sir. Sometimes they torture them first. I winced. Surely not Lorraine. She was no witch. I shook the girl from me and went in Inga's shop. She was behind the counter cutting some fabric. Hello, Lord Leviticus. How can I help thee? She looked up and smiled like a cat with a wing between its teeth. Inga, is it true they will murder Lorraine? Not murder. She was found guilty at trial. Guilty of witchcraft, Lorraine. She's as much a witch as you are. Less than me. I shook my head disbelievingly. Trial and hanging. Who testified against her? At this she got up to get something from behind the curtain that she had sewn herself embroidered with apples and blossoms. I did. I've witnessed her art. Art? She consorts with demons. So do you. What? She came out looking at me now. Listen. I've seen her sharpening her teeth, and the other day in court they threw an egg at her and she ran. Now God knows that be a sure sign of witchery. Who else testified against her, Inga? Who else witnessed these things? I wouldn't know. Why wouldn't you? I got a little closer to her and smelled her lie, her nervousness. Because those things, court things, are kept secret from the townsfolk. Oh, because I was going to say that a man cannot be punished with the testimony of only one witness. Yes, but she's a woman, a foreigner no less, and they can do to her whatever they please. She smiled again like a fat child. She's jailed already. Don't take long. She has children. I know. I believe the little bastards to be somewhat implicated. Albert wasn't supposed to marry some French slut anyways. They won't kill those children. Who was he supposed to marry? Someone from here, from town, his own people. Lorraine will not die, Inga. Oh, yes, she will. They're hanging her the day after tomorrow, and I'm going to watch. No, you won't. I bolted the door and lowered the blinds within a second's time. Then I grabbed her from behind and covered her mouth with my hand. Now you listen to me. And I have lived here since your grandmother was a child, so I know, and you will listen. I twisted her head round tight and fast to see my hellish mouth. Her eyes wept, and she nodded her head before I ripped it off. 
You are writing a letter now here. I force her down at the desk, letting go. If you scream, I'll rip your swine heart out. She nodded again and got parchment from the drawer and a quill from the pigeonhole. Good. Excellent. You can write, too. Such a smart girl. Such a waste. Townsfolk. Write exactly as I say or I'll eat your face first while you're living. Don't shake. You'll spoil your penmanship. Townsfolk. Lorraine, wife of Lord Albert III, is not guilty of witchcraft. I lied because I am having an adulterous affair with his lordship, and that is why the Lord has plagued me with an angel of vengeance. Do not make my mistake out of selfishness and wickedness of pride. Inga Shore. She looked at me defiantly. I squeezed her neck. She wrote my say. Then I painted the place in her blood and burned it to the ground. I nailed the parchment to the church door. Lorraine was not hung. 